Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, our guest is Nick Mottern, and we will be talking, among other things, about the upcoming Merchants of Death War Crimes Tribunal. Nick Mottern is a longtime peace activist, reporter, researcher, speaker, uh, prop creator, uh, and much else. He is co-coordinator of BanKillerDrones.org. He is organizer of Merchants of Death War Crimes Tribunal. He's a member of the National Board of Veterans for Peace and many other uh, qualifications. Nick Mottern, welcome to Talk World Radio. Thank you, David. I'm really happy to be here this morning. Thanks for coming on. Can you tell us about the Merchants of Death War Crimes Tribunal? Yes, uh, beginning on November 12th, on Sunday evening, uh, we're going to be uh, hosting the first episode and the introduction to a tribunal that will take the form of a series of uh, video episodes that will be on Rumble uh, online platform. Every week we'll have a new episode dealing with war crimes committed by the United States, enabled by Lockheed Martin, Boeing, Raytheon, and the drone killer drone maker uh, General Atomics. And we are going to be holding these companies accountable for enabling these war crimes. This is something that's very similar to what happened after World War II, where uh, major industrialists, uh, Krupp, uh, uh, Farben, others, were held accountable at Nuremberg for assisting in war crimes undertaken by the Nazi government. Also similar to what happened after World War I, where there was something called the Nye Committee. It was formed in the U.S. Senate to look at war profiteering and how uh, military contractors at that time, weapons makers, were uh, moving forward to in, you know, basically profit off of a variety of wars that were going on at that time, as well as having profited immensely from World War I. So our task is really to be historians and, uh, and educators and, and motivators uh, for people not to learn about what's happened and also to do something about it going forward. Um, and so that's, I think, you know, a, a very encapsulated view of what's going on because there are a lot, you know, there's a lot of research and there are a lot of people involved with this. So please ask some questions. <laughs> So this is going to be online, not in some real world place, and it's going to be at merchantsofdeath.org, or that's where you can find how to watch it. And the first session is sometime on November the 12th. Is that right? That's right. It'll be in the evening. I think it's going to start at 7.15 uh, p.m. Eastern. Um, and we're very grateful, of course, for your enabling World Beyond War uh, to be part of this, this opening session. At that session, we'll explain what's going on, some of the history of, of, of these kind of tribunals, and we'll introduce uh, people who are jurors who, after we've presented all this evidence over several months' time, will be coming to some conclusions about what people uh, can do about m merchants of death. So following World War II, there were trials, there were hearings and convictions and sentences of uh, selected, you know, one side and even there, very selective, uh, war profiteering business executives and propagandists, but also of government officials. Uh, and here you're not going after the heads of any of the governments that have ordered these weapons into use. You're going after only the producers of the weapons. Uh, why that decision? Because we've moved into a, a kind of realm where because of the uh, technology that is, is developing so rapidly, uh, the weapons makers have more and more impact on military uh, 
conduct and, and military decisions. But it's also true that without the weapons makers, we couldn't have, we being the United States government, which I certainly separate myself from when it comes to war, could not have undertaken these, these adventures. Um, and the widespread suffering, death, as I've looked over, you know, the history of these things, it brought back memories of certain things I'd read in the paper, you know, and the, online and on television. But the sum total of it over the last 20 years has, has affected millions and millions of people. Hundreds of thousands of people have, have been killed in this process. And politicians have their excuses but the people who make the weapons are also fundamentally responsible for, for what happens. And one thing that is very interesting at the Nuremberg trials was the, uh, the, the whole premise that, uh, you know, military people would give or, or you know, industrials would give, well, we were just following orders. You know, this, this is what the government wanted. This is what we did. And these were atrocities. We understand that, but we were following orders. That premise was blown away at Nuremberg. People were held personally responsible for their actions. And that's what we're, we're, we're doing here. And we are not allowing these very key people to hide behind the idea, well, we're just supporting the government. Yeah. The, uh, <coughs> the, the, I, I really appreciate your specifying that when you use the word we, you meant the U.S. government. Uh, I have for decades had ongoing conversations with people trying to get them to stop using words like we and our and us to mean the Pentagon or the U.S. president. Uh, and I recently persuaded a couple of people who sort of a light bulb switched on and they said, oh my God, I finally get it and I see why it matters and i'm going to say the u.s military rather than us uh and you know how i persuaded them i recounted something that you had said nick Montern, at a recent peace conference that we were at together uh, about what malcolm x said that a house slave and a field slave might say when the master is sick can you can you explain that bit well it's it's a it's a it's a very uh profound insight put in, put in a very simple simple way by Malcolm X, who, who was really a genius for doing that. And um, he, he was talking about the field Negro and the house Negro. And so uh, the house Negro lived in the master's house, uh, he said in the attic or in the basement, but the, identified completely with the master out of self-interest, out of, you know, close proximity, whatever. And so if the, if the master was sick, he said, I'm sick, the house Negro would say, we sick. Whereas the field Negro would say, I hope he dies. And it's, it's a, I think, a very, very strong patriotic kind of pressure we you know grow up in schools i was learned to salute the flag we see the flag in churches we we associate our identity with this but these emotions are really uh stolen if you want to say uh in the interest of really horrible brutality and other people in other lands look at the American flag <clears throat> in not the same way that, that we do. And so it's very important for us to separate ourselves emotionally from, the, from our government, I, in, my, my, in my opinion, especially from the violent, systematic violence that is part of our government. A friend of mine, an Italian woman, said to me one time, you know, the, the government and the mafia are not that different. Uh, they extort, they use violence, they're unaccountable, they operate in secret, and their, you know, their power is in, in, in fear. 
And that's really where we've gotten to with our government here. And so, uh, you know, it, it's interesting, for instance, that uh, after uh, Sandy Hook, uh, the, the, this in, really insane young man shot all these children and a lawsuit was filed against the gun manufacturer um, and, and they were they were found guilty I, I think of advertising or, or, or something that related to how they how they promoted their their weapons but they they had to they had to come forward and they had to be held accountable you know with a money money penalty um, because the, the, the plaintiffs or parents quite rightly argued that the, the easy access the the, the, the whole aura of, of uh, power through through violence that makes tremendous amounts of money that these weapons makers must also be held accountable and more and more if you look at evolution of uh, energy weapons uh, like laser weapons if, uh, artificial intelligence guiding uh, all kinds of, of decisions in, in war the weapons makers are exploring all these realms of violence uh, to make money period and at, but at the same time they are giving you know with drones too i mean as a capital example they're giving uh generals uh, and politicians the power to be held less and less accountable uh, because the fewer uh, Americans, quote unquote, whoever Americans are, people who are citizens of the United States, the fewer of those people who have to go and get killed in these wars, and the more the wars can be conducted robotically, even though at the end everybody dies, uh, the political consequences for war are less and less immediate for politicians. So the, the weapons actually encourage callousness, irresponsibility, viciousness, and war crimes. And so we're not, we're not in a civil war right now. We're in a whole other technological war situation that gets more and more dangerous because there's less and less political threat to doing a war. There's no question. Uh, we're speaking with Nick Mottern, uh, coordinator, among other things, organizer of the Merchants of Death War Crimes Tribunal coming up November 12th. Uh, Nick, overwhelmingly, the the sorry to stick with this question of, of we for a second, but I, I'm so interested in it. Uh, overwhelmingly, the biggest pushback you get is, well, I pay taxes and I must be responsible and identify with the government that I'm responsible for. Otherwise, I'm not being responsible for it. And it seems to me that people pay state taxes and they never say we, us, our about the state government or the local government or organizations they make donations to. They never, people send checks to World Beyond War and they never say we, they, they say you, and but they can send me ideas and we do our very best to enact them. Uh, whereas you could send your ideas to the federal government and they will be ignored. Uh, and, and people say we, us, our, about the Pentagon and the White House on Zoom calls with people from around the world. It's like yeah. being in a group of people of all appearances and saying we white folks, you don't do that normally. Am, am well, I crazy? I know, I think, I think you're onto something very, very uh, important and, and, and very powerful because speaking for myself, it, you know, if you, if somebody could, you know, stick a needle into my brain and pull out, you know, some matter that would show, yes, this guy is very proud of being part of the most powerful country in the world. You know, when I go to travel and, you know, I lose my passport or, you know, somebody picks my pocket or who knows what, almost any country you're in, you can go to some U.S government you know office to embassy and get help that you that no other person from any other country can you know you, can, you just can't do that you know, they don't maybe even have an embassy they don't have it you're just an average 
schmo trying to to make your way and i think there's a there's a kind of a pride and arrogance and you know triumphalism about saying i'm an american and i think educated into that you know i had, I had a friend who uh was an editorial writer he worked first with the providence journal where i worked then he went to the new york times on the editorial board there and then he and his wife went back to london during the vietnam war because he, he they just couldn't take what was going on and he said it was a great relief to be in a country that was no longer uh, a world power, you know, a superpower. There, yeah. He just felt, wow, I can breathe, you know. And I, I think there's the psychology of this is is really powerful, and it, to my mind, it closes off and closes many many doors for looking at opportunities. Uh, to, to work with other people, to experience other things. And we can get ourselves here very locked into the master's way of thinking about the world, which is U.S. versus China versus Russia. How are we going to carve up the world the way, you know, Europe carved up Africa in 1884? And meanwhile, we miss everything else, which is much more interesting, much more life giving. And um, so I, what you're talking about is, is very, very important, I think. So the, the Merchants of Death War Crimes Tribunal uh, is very much needed uh, in order to go after uh, these companies, the biggest and worst of which are all based right around Washington, DC what's what's the outcome going to be? Are there going to be judgments? Are there going to be sentences? Uh, what well, I think what we're going to be doing is we're going to, we're going to be recommending you know, what pu public action that, that we need to take, uh, protests, uh, civil disobedience around certain uh, areas, certain uh, subjects. Um, we're also going to be trying to lay out legal pathways that can be followed in other countries as well as this country for prosecuting the heads of some of these corporations because they are war criminals and there, there is precedent for going after war criminals. Um, and we'll also be looking at legal pathways for getting rep reparations from these corporations. And so ideally, it'll be something where prosecutors in other countries who have you know suffered under this may decide or who have not who just may decide it's their responsibilities as a citizen of world humanity to, to uh, arrest the head of lockheed martin when they go to majorca for a vacation or you know somebody else who might decide well let's go to to uh, Malaysia and, and have some fun over there and then find themselves um, having been arrested. We want to make it very, I, I think, clear to other people in the world that there are ways to hold these people accountable. And, and I, I hope that we can be successful at that. It seems to me you're up against worse propaganda on weapons makers than I've ever seen or imagined before. You have nations being told you must spend 2% of your economy on weapons as if it's a public good, as if it's philanthropy or doing your service as a member of the world to spend as much as you can afford on weapons, regardless of justification. Uh, you have weapons being sent to Ukraine as humanitarian aid. We must send more weapons. This is not what we, we don't send troops, we send weapons. But in like, the Space Force, the weapons dealers are treated as the troops, as the members of the Space Force. Uh, and and you, I've seen people wearing Lockheed Martin t-shirts. Uh, you know, they're pushing weapons dealing, not as a shameful but necessary act, but as something proud and absolutely shameless. How do you, how do you counter this? Well, I think that um, one way to, to do it is to show what, what the result of their activities have been over the last 20 years. Many, many people who we want to watch this 
were born. Uh, I saw you somebody last night. They were born on two th in two thousand and one. Um, they have no idea what's happened by and large between 2001 and now in, in terms of these wars they were they were basically children most of the time yeah and millions of people have been killed and countries have yeah. been destroyed that's right and so our challenge is really to to bring forward a history of this in, in a way that is it's not it's just like simple like we could weekly reader but bring it forward in a way that people can pick up key points uh, it's very challenging we don't have uh, really hardly any budget at all most of the work has been done you know as a volunteer uh, it is it's and looking at all over I, I can say right now there's there are things that I wish we could do I wish we uh, you know could amplify and, and do it but we're, we're we're basically doing the best we can um but at the end of it we we hope that people younger people especially will know some key points of history even that preceded 2001 things about colonialism things the united states did in the philippines to to, to colonize the philippines um so we're going to talk, you know, about about these things carrying forward. The United States is basically a, a country that has thrived being a colonial power first against the native people here, then in other parts of the world. The, you can easily analyze the Ukraine war as a colonial war. You can easily analyze this whole thing of, you know, you have to spend more on your military, like it's your obligation as you know. In the, in the world as pressure to participate in the colonialism as engineered by the United States. The European countries are frightened of the United States. They are going to be obedient to the United States. They feel that their economies are intrinsically tied up with our economy, which is fundamentally a failing economy because of its dependency on fossil fuels and on violence. And it's just being held together by God knows what, but it's it, the system is failing and people really fundamentally feel that. I just, it, it, it was, I just want to say, but I believe the reason it's failing is because of its dependency on violence and, and, and it's nurturing of violence. It's, it's very interesting. I was born in 1939. Many, many people, you know, as I was growing up, overwhelmed by the Second World War. Uh, how many, how many people, you know, men went there to die? How many women went there to die? How many women and men came back insane? Uh, and yet, at that time, we had a great, and after World War One, a great public concern about war profiteering, about people thriving off the blood of the of Americans, you know, fighting and dying, as, as they would say. Now we have a situation where very few Americans go and fight and die. The machines go and kill other people in other countries. And so now it's become totally acceptable, enthusiastically generated, you know, among pension funds, you know, college endowments, whatever to invest and gamble on the next war. How many people are gonna be able to be slaughtered by these weapons? And, and for me as Lockheed Martin, I wanna tell you, oh wow, I have got something now that is a super weapon beyond anything I cooked up last year that's gonna let you kill more people without worrying about killing Americans. That is sick. But when the self-interest goes out of stopping wars, then you have speculation on killing. And my opinion is that that has warped this economy, it has warped people's thinking, and really makes it hard for us to think about climate change, for example. You know, it's like, oh yeah, that's good. We'll, we'll do that later. Meanwhile, we have a, a government who is going to make a deal, mutual defense pact, 
with Saudi Arabia, who who is the head of the government is, you know, never said, I'm sorry for slicing and dicing this reporter Khashoggi. And now we're want to make a mutual defense treaty, which I guess, you know, Kathy Kelly was saying, well, if Yemen attacks Saudi Arabia with with uh, homemade drones, you know, the Houthis, then the U.S. has to go to war against Yemen. I mean, this is where we are in terms of dependency, violence, and 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 feeling well, we don't have to be accountable for any of this stuff. Uh, very well said, Nick Matra. We got about three minutes left. There is some movement to go after fossil fuel producing companies. Will you guys be talking about the companies you're looking at as some of the primary consumers of fossil fuels, not to mention the armors of wars over the control of fossil fuels, not to mention the people who are sucking up all the money uh, that's needed for going after uh, protecting the climate, not to mention the creators of the even worse danger of nuclear apocalypse. Yes, of course, we'll be we'll be wanting people to totally disinvest from these companies. Much of the use of fossil fuels and the degree to which they're used now are because they, the pumping of the oil is being reinforced at gunpoint. You have, you know, Iraqis. We're, we're still occupying Iraq. Sorry, guys. You know, if you don't think that's true. Well, OK, I mean. Look at what goes on in Nigeria. You look at all over the world where oil is being pumped. You'll find violence. You'll find government repression. And so it all is really so interconnected that the central point to me and, and is we have to stop the violence. See what our economy, after we stop doing war, and going around the world and getting things at gunpoint, then let's see how our economy is. Let's see, we have to consume less maybe, maybe we'll have to find other ways, you know, to get along with other people without putting a gun up into their nose. That's, I think, the challenge for the world right now. I think you're absolutely right. Uh, we have been speaking with Nick Matern, who is co-coordinator of BanKillerDrones.org and organizer of the upcoming Merchants of Death War Crimes Tribunal. You can go to MerchantsOfDeath.org and a member of the National Board of Veterans for Peace, which is at VeteransForPeace.org. Nick Matern, thank you very, very much for coming on Talk World Radio. Thank you, David. I really appreciate it. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.